When it comes to old obscure PS1 games, I gotta admit, sometimes I do be sitting there like, do I want to play Doug Walker or do I want to play Doug Walker? this dumb idea right since day one where it flipped turn upside down the japanese ps1 only game titles to become a joke i'd constantly rev up the title intensity with bizarre weird wacky odd outrageous crazy and then suddenly boom very normal japan only ps1 games with the idea being that these would not be on a jogo type beat but instead games you know games you might love but just in japanese However, I soon realized that none of this worked. As you see, the title made no sense, as the games wouldn't be Japan only, even a little bit. I'd also step away from this build-up scheme, as after three videos I moved on to other systems, and also just, uh... There's not nearly enough content here for a full 30 minutes plus dagnab and booty banger of a video. And so I sort of shelved the project to a footnote in my notes to take note of whenever this topic would be relevant for another bigger video. Only that's dumb though, innit? Why the heck should every release be this big epic thing? Like if I ever become one of those YouTubers Ready? who only drops a 5 hour video 3 times a year, cancel me by all means, as I'd have become a hollowed husk shell of my former self anyway. Anyway, did you know that in the Japanese version of Spyro The Legend of the Dragoon, the game has cinematic Silent Hill 1 style camera angles? Whoa! Intro! So yeah, that is indeed what this version is. Homey runs slower too as to concede to make shit work and generally the whole vibe and feel of the game changed along with the camera. The skyboxes are less visible, the vistas less sprawling, the freedom less free. It's like Spyro with his wings clipped in all senses that that could apply to. I mean, for one, when charging, his turning arc is much wider and he feels stiffer to control, likely so that he wouldn't speed out of frame and or jerk the camera around GBA style, but this already slows the game down considerably. To adjust for this, enemies also react slower or are less likely to engage from further away which isolates you more from the action, which then, when paired with the obfuscating viewpoints that hide a lot of the animations and vibrancy you'd otherwise see hella front and center, it just makes for a much less joyful feeling experience. Easier in large parts, but more obtuse at the same time. It's quite odd. You literally feel this juxtaposition as well when you go from the title sequence with the big mountains and airy open skyboxes as Spyro whizzes by bouncing a bitch boy off top with attitude, to then not going to a game that plays that way, but to a game where you're fighting with the camera for the most part and stop then in your tracks to read tutorial text. Not things I'd normally ever complain about at all. I love weird and awkward games and I don't think it's even bad or horrible here neither, but I am pointing this out as it sticks out so much in comparison. I do find it very interesting how normalized helping the player is. Stinky ass reviewers from a decade ago would no doubt complain about this to feign some semblance of superiority over something, but I think it's generally a good thing to extend hands and shit, and Japanese games used to be better on average with that being more text heavy. Here, you do get tutorial text, and the levels are marked with numbers as to show a clear sense of progression. On the other hand, though, that was what the talking dragons were for in the first place, and it's also not exactly a complicated game. Besides, I think it's mostly a good thing to let kids intuit shit and treat them with respect, but still, it is a neat difference. Also, <laughs> it has cuts. Like when you jump down a well or go up one of those whirlwinds, it doesn't just swoop you up there, it cuts. Stuff like this, along with everything else, just invokes a very different playstyle. I caught myself walking more, briskly frolicking, and noticing smaller details like how the flowers burn when fire, or how the camera clips into the wall every fucking second. It's a different energy. A <laughs> worse energy, far as I'm concerned, but that might just be me. And this does beg the question, why is it like that anyway? 
Well, I was sort of going to talk about this a lot, but much like examples of games for this video, I couldn't find all too many provable examples of why this should be. For instance, I've definitely read multiple times that RE4 wasn't received super well by fans initially due to the camera controls, as Japanese players were much less used to games with controllable cameras, which was more common abroad. But I can't at all confirm this. It sounds like some ignorant internet bullshit, and I also don't feel like booting up the JP version to maybe get get footage of it having more tutorials, but that's all I had. Solely the promise that Japanese folks weren't as accustomed to more traditional third-person cameras and that Spyro was changed to suit that. However, I had J Games journalist Oni Dino look into it too, and according to some Japanese sources, the original game was focus tested as is, but the camera swerve, which I've also brought up before, ended up making a few kids motion sick, or <laughs> 3D sickness, as two literally translated weeb articles call it, which is objectively a better term, and I will now use it. Thus. Going by that though, I think I can say that the targeted audience was probably lower than it was over here, and so the game was dulled and slow to smidge with big colorful tutorial signs so that literal babies could play. I mean, just look at the box art. Rounded. Cuter. Happier. Baby game. Booting the dude and adding a logo that looks like it says Ripto, which is how the villain in the second game came to be, ain't that neat. Also, uh, is this game any different? Well. Uh, it's called Spyro and Sparks Tom Demo Tours. But otherwise, it's pretty much the same game, just with the minimap enabled by default. Thanks fucking god, though, because cause sometimes with one, I, I did kind of just want to... So uh, I got this weird thing for collecting old crash renders, as some of these are simply Like of course, there's the classic, the GOAT, Hip Hop Crash, Naughty Dog branded boombox, Crash Gold Knuckles, Gold Tooth, the chain that someone has defo recreated IRL by now. It's a great render. Similar energy as the fastest DJ MC Sonic. Come in bad boys. Can I kick it? Yes, Eggman. Rasta Eggman, of course. Rayman also tried this, only, um... Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not so keen on how this one turned out. The, the clothes are fine, but I'd have to tan them up that way. Anyway, back to Crash. We got Santa Crash. <laughs> Very cursed. Why is he making that face? Moreover, why is he making this face? In front of someone who's sleeping, no less. Actually, aside from some of the earlier ones where he's more tweaky and scared, he is mostly not making a good face. Uh, thanks. I hate it. And then there's Japanese Crash, who is in a whole entire league of his own. Being more pointy, but not any less horrifying, often staring more intensely with the white of his eyes peering directly into the soul. Somehow, though, despite that, him and his games actually appealed pretty bigly in Japan, which is rare for a Western series to do, especially back then. Probably in part because unlike Spyro, they didn't completely destroy the game and left it mostly as is, but it does once again have tutorial text, which is neat. TNT has bomb on it because those letters wouldn't really mean shit in Japanese. Your bitch fucking evaporates when you get close, and uh... That's mostly it. They did give Crash a new voice, which is sort of odd given that he doesn't speak at all, except that here he does. Says stuff when you pick levels and makes additional sounds on the box telly screen and also his voice is fucking horrible. The bonus levels have a new track with skunk trumpets as well, but otherwise it's the same old Crash one. A game that, once again, did surprisingly well in Japan, and so I figured I'd check out the second one too to see if maybe, emboldened by the success, they decided to put in a little more effort in adding in the changes for the sequel and, oh boy, there's a theme song. Masks now talk at you too, which is cute, and luckily they ditched the awful Crash voice and just left the man as is, as they is with the rest of the game too, which I'll assume is the case for Crash 3 as well. CTR though... Oh. So here the redesign actually made it into the game, or on the title screen at least. While playing, it's the regularly cursed Crash model. <laughs> But there is more talking, Crash's JP voice is back and the portraits are different, but that's generally it. 
And yeah, this is basically what I ran into when I had the original video idea. Spiral 1 filled me with intrigue and hope that there'd be more radical ass changes out there, but that's not really the case. Except for one game. Which we'll get to later. Like I was gonna move on to Gex, cause fucking... <laughs> look at his goddamn box art and redesign. Surely this must be something wild, right? Uh, but no, it's just Gex. 3DO Gex on PS1, which is a game I want to save for a future 3DO extravaganza video anyway, and I can't fucking for the life of me find a ROM for Gex 2 or 3 from Japan, though the box art is once again fucking great. Little dude, little guy, little man, but that's what most of these stick to. Cooler box art and a better or funnier title. And so, I think it might be high time to take a look at some of the Patreon shit, bitch, hoes and tricks. Patreon shit, bitch, hoes and tricks. Bitch, Patreon shit, bitch, hoes and tricks. So making motherfuckers, they pay my shit. Bitch, Patreon shit, bitch, hoes and tricks. Okay, so first of all, we got Tomb Raiders, plural. Ass focus instead of booba, and also easier and dub. I don't know why so many of these are made easier, unless like Spyro, it's also due to baby intentions, but with this one, I am very okay with it, as fuck the difficulty in the originals, goddamn. Also, Ape A Go Go is objectively a better title than Honest Abe's Mario Odyssey or whatever the fuck they actually call it. Same with Croc, Pow Pow Island. Look at us, Crimblo! Just the chillest, sunniest, beachiest vibes. Game ain't really that way though, but that's okay. Oh, and dude, dude, the fucking goddamn, the, the goddamn fucking Japanese GTA 1 box art. Uh, holy shit. Or the driver one? Goddamn. Looks like 2017 era me designed it. Shit bangs. Also, can we get a shout out to Kula Quest? It's a journey now. A adventure. But still mostly the same game, which is 100% Gucci as shit's Vibe City as is and don't need no changes. Wipeout 3 also has amazing box art in Japan. Medieval's is pretty nice too. Just a good ass illustration and a doper logo. And ATV Power Quad Racing makes a kind of mid, generally not all that interesting game look like the dopest stylized shit ever. Sadly though, most games tend to be entirely the same. Spider-Man, Tony Hawk, Twisted Metal all have pretty much identical box art and the games remain virtually untouched. However, there is one last game that has seen by far and away the biggest overhaul ever. I mean, you know how certain simple 2000 PS2 games made it over to Europe, but under entirely different names and titles, with all the hints of Japan scrubbed off of the marketing? Well, this game is literally exactly one of the very few instances of the polar opposite happening in Japan. Everyone, I bring you Magical Hoppers, or as you may know it, Pandemonium. Well, guess it's fucking till it's time till after time. all. Learning about this one's a little weird for me as it's the only game in this video that I'm not even a little bit familiar with. Wikipedia tells me that it's a Toys for Bob joint, which is neat because that's almost a full circle type of thing with Crash. If I was really on the ball right now, I would have started the video with Crash instead of Spyro, but clearly we are not on that level at the moment. In any case, it's about these two creepy jester ass motherfuckers who I can't say I like going on fun little weird little platformery adventures, which I can say that I like. The aesthetics are what I imagine Tomba would have been if it was made by Americans and uses a lot of medieval and fairy tale type tropages with the castles and the musics, but then also trippy as balls, space gaze and cool camera movements. It's an odd, bouncy game that's pretty cool. But Magical Hoppers is about a magical girl and a magical man from the Cyber Zone anime land being transported to the magical realm, and so it's a isekai, I think. The bulk of the game, though, is pretty much the same, which is both good and bad, as well it is a fun game, super simple, can only walk left to right and jump, but the jumpings is super bouncy and the level design is great and has a good explorative feel to it, with hella corners, cubby holes, bridges, jumps, and elevators and cool interconnected vibes that make the game feel like one big long distance journey across this ever-changing, winding, big variety weird land. It is also bad as the game has lives and so when you die, you die back to the fucking title screen and you can't save only password. It's from 96, so I guess shit just be that way, but that really kills my fucking stride because you lose progress hell. And seeing as most of these JP versions are easier, I really hope that this would have been rectified in Magical Hoppers, but nope. Same game, different characters and story. Still though, a super interesting localization attempt and a pretty rare one at that.
And yeah, that's basically all I got. Again, this topic wasn't quite as rife with mysterious Jogos as I'd hoped it'd be, but shit was still pretty fun. Sometimes Doug Walker is just Doug Walker instead of Doug Walker. And similarly, there is also no Japanese version of Yugo for PS1. Yugo for PS1. But they do have breeding studs, so it all evens out. To be, uh, to be honest, I should get on that. Japan only horse games. You got Chrome Horse. Chrome Horse Inbreed Edition. You got the whole fucking winning post series with its wide range of insane box arts and really awkward looking story modes. And you got Juan. Wow, horse games. They might not be matchstick for Nintendo DS, but they do be horse games.